Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Shtib and Zang show. It is episode 14. Um, Eric, we have been teasing uh, a certain special guest for weeks now. Yeah. And finally, uh, this episode, we get to uh, interview that guest. But Eric, we actually have a sponsorship first uh, to, go, to go with first or to, um, to, to present to you. Uh, viewers and listeners, uh, this episode is actually uh, actually brought to you by Mike's Barbecue Rub. Visit Mike's Barbecue Rub and mm-hmm. use code Hot Sauce Ten for ten percent off upon checkout. They do have the best barbecue rubs for your ribs and the best mustard truffle mm-hmm. sauce ever. It's the best sauce in the world, it's hand down, uh, hands down. So visit Mike's Barbecue Rub and use Hot Sauce Ten for ten percent off. And um, Get that sauce and don't forget to rub your meat. So uh, let's yeah. hop into the interview, Eric, uh, and interview our special guest. But first, as always, roll it! Welcome back to the Stib and Zang show. I'm Stib. I am, uh, that is Zang. Um, Eric, we are joined by a very special guest, a guest that we've been teasing for weeks now on the show, and it's finally come to fruitation, and we are all here uh, in the same Zoom meeting, and um, we're lucky, uh, Sally, we're not uh, able to do this in person, but uh, this we'll have to do. Um, for those who have uh, already um, seen our guest and recognizes him good for you but for those on the little younger side and new to the nhl and don't recognize the man we are sitting with uh well we are joined um by an author a hockey f- a hockey hall of famer a foster hewitt recipient and of course was the voice of the montreal canadians for decades over on hockey night in canada we are joined by dick Irvin jr Everyone give me the clap up. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Mr. Thank Irvin, you. on the well, show. Well, thank you, Matthew and Eric. I appreciate you thinking about me. <laughs> no <laughs> problem. <think> <laughs> well, yeah. we are here um, to pretty much get in touch with our younger audience, uh, have a brief history of the Montreal Canadiens, uh, basically from this book that I bought, uh, My 26 Stanley Cups. This is one of many books you actually wrote, um, and it's about – your 26 Stanley Cups that you saw in person get lifted. And uh, I read this book. Anyone interested in the history of the Canadians or uh, his, interested in the life of Miss uh, Dick Irvin Jr., I highly recommend this book. Uh, probably can get it on Amazon. It's full of hockey history and knowledge, and it's just a great read for anyone interested. And this is actually where we start our interview is in the book and actually the title of the book. Uh, my 26 Stanley Cups, because like I said, you were there uh, for all those cups lifted. It's a very um, uh, great record, not the best record, but still one that uh, 26 Stanley Cups, a lot of people could say they haven't done that. Yeah. So for the first question um, of my 26 Stanley Cups, out of all those Stanley Cups that you saw in person live, which ones hold a special place in your heart? I'm, I'm sorry that didn't i didn't quite hear that oh that's okay i said um everything is frozen here frozen it's not working it's not okay. it's not working so my first question uh, actually involves the title of the book my 26 stanley cups obviously the reason being called 26 stanley cup is because you were there in person to watch it live uh, my question is, out of those 26 Stanley Cups, which one hold a special place in your heart to this day? Well, to be, uh, the first one I, I saw was I was eight years old um, in Toronto. To, uh, you know, to pick out one is very difficult yeah. to read because every time you see a Stanley Cup one, and especially when I became a broadcaster and was part of the scene and and many times I'd be in the dressing room afterwards of the winning team doing the interviews, which I hated to do, quite frankly, <laughs> because you always got champagne thrown on your face. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't see. Um, it, uh, th- there were a few. There, there's the last one, which is how I, that's the first chapter in the book. It's mm-hmm. called The Last One, uh, was special because uh, it was the New York Rangers. And they had not won the Stanley Cup since 1940. Yeah. And they haven't won it since either, like, what, yeah. once in 80 years or something like yeah. that. 
And I had seen both. And there was one other man who has since passed away, a writer, hockey writer named Norm McLean, who also had been in Toronto in 1940, saw the Rangers win, and then was in Madison Square Garden in 1994 to see the Rangers win again. They hadn't had won in between. Yeah. Uh, that's a special memory for me because of uh, the gap. And, and I think I am the only living person right now who can say that, who was at yeah. both of those wins. Uh, the 1971 uh, championship was uh, when the Canadians won when they weren't supposed to. Uh, they won the first series against Bobby Orr and the Big Bad Bruins uh, when Boston had finished miles ahead of them in the regular season. Uh, and they brought up an unknown goalie named Ken Dryden. We used to call him Ken Who, because we didn't know who he was. And they went on to win the Cup uh, in Game 7 in Chicago. That was a special year. That was the last time. That was John Balbo's last game. And he carried the Cup off the ice at the Chicago Stadium, which was very fitting. But I guess, really, the, 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 the number one would be 1953, uh, which was the only time that I saw a team coached by my father win the Stanley yeah. Cup. He won oh, yeah. four cups. The first one he won, I was like one month old, so I wasn't <laughs> that game. And uh, that was, uh, you know, it's, it's like uh, it happened last night to me. Yeah. Uh, uh, the winning goal was scored by Al Merlock uh, in overtime at the Forum in Montreal. And it, uh, for me, from a personal standpoint, uh, it, of course, couldn't get any better than that. Of course. Always yeah. some pretty great cup years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I have another question for you here. So uh, in 1950, you actually got the chance to practice with the Montreal Canadiens team. What was that experience like for you? <laughs> Scary. <laughs> sure. I was attending the University of Saskatchewan. My dad used to commute. He'd coach the Canadians in the winter, and he'd go home to Regina, Saskatchewan in the summer. And I was going to uh, the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, and I played hockey for the U of S Huskies. And uh, so when I came down, we came down to visit my dad at Christmas time, my mother, my sister, myself. And I always used to bring my skates and because uh, then I could skate at the forum, you know. And this time he put it, he made me put a uniform on. I didn't have any choice. I didn't want to. I was too scared. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, what, what are you going to do? Uh, yeah. Never mind him being the coach. He was my dad. So there yeah. I was out taking a regular turn in a scrimmage. <laughs> of all things. I thought I, yeah. I would be prefer just to do drills or something. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I write in the book about how I checked Ken Mosdell. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was for real. He uh, tried to deke me, but I've been tipped off by an old time hockey player that for Kenny Mosdell, don't play the body or he'll, you'll end up in the first row of the seats. He'll deke you <laughs> right out of your socks, but play the puck. So I did. I remembered that. And oh, I got the puck away from him. That's the one thing I remember. It uh, was, uh, I'm sure the hockey players, my God, they must have thought, what is this? I was 18 at the time. Oh, wow. And uh, not a very good hockey player, although good enough to play college <laughs> hockey. There were only two college hockey uh, setups in Canada at that time, one in the East, one in the West. And so I played in the West for Saskatchewan. Then we moved to Montreal full time the following summer, and I ended up playing the next two years for the uh, hockey team at McGill. Wow. Um, before working as a broadcaster for Hockey Night in Canada, you actually worked many interesting jobs specifically for the Montreal Canadiens organization. Uh, most uh, notable, in 1951, you actually worked as a statistician um, for the team. And in 1958, you became the Canadiens' official scorer. Do you have any stories about that particular job? I know, because I read the book, that there were some players very greedy when it came to extra points. Uh, specifically of Mr. Doug Harvey. Can you tell us that story? Well, you see, in those days, the guys didn't make very much money, and they would get bonuses for points. Yeah. And maybe $100, maybe $500. What would be in their contract? I don't know. So you had to be careful. And uh, the official score is the guy who phones down to the PA guy after a goal goes in and says, number, number seven from number nine and number 11, you know, things like that. Yeah. And uh, that's what you made the call. Now, the referee was supposed to make the call as well, but half the time they didn't. <laughs> uh, they couldn't have cared less. So you were really left on your own. There were no replays in those days. I didn't have the benefit of a replay machine. I used to have to explain to a lot of the newspaper men what happened in the play because they didn't <laughs> figure it out. And uh, so that was the job I had. Actually, you're not working for the Canadians at a time like that. You're working Worry for the for league. The league. Uh, yeah. the, the Canadians appoint you and then you're actually an employee, what they call a minor official. 
They still have them. Uh, they're, yeah. they're still there. Mm-hmm. You know, the guys in the penalty box, uh, the gold judges, uh, that they're all, we were all part of the group called the minor officials. And uh, Doug Harvey used to pick up the phone at the penalty box and phone me. And I was upstairs in the catwalk at the forum. And he would ball me out if I didn't give a proper assist <laughs> because they would give che- they figured they give cheap assists to Gordy Howe in Detroit. That's how he <laughs> always won the scoring championship. But they do it for Howe in Detroit. You don't do it here, so and so. And the guy didn't deserve. Uh, yeah. they, that's what you had to put up with. I had two members of the Boston Bruins one night chase me around the corridor at the Forum looking for assists <clears> on, a, <throat> on goals in a game that they lost by about five or six goals. They were the worst team in the league, and the Canadians were the best. And that's all these guys cared about, which kind of shows you why they were in last place, yeah. as I say in my book. So that was a, an interesting job. It was, you know, they, they, they'd they send you away on the road. Like when the playoffs would start, I wouldn't do Montreal. I'd go to, to Chicago and Detroit or, you know, Toronto and mm-hmm. Boston or something like that. Uh, but it was a, an interesting part of my life. I was working at the time for the Shell Oil Company. Uh, okay, yeah. But even after I started working in television and doing the news and so on, I still did it uh, most nights at home games at the forum. Wow. Okay, wait, before you move on here, because someone's vacuuming my house, so I'm just going to tell them to stop vacuuming. Quick, quick. So wait, Eric, isn't it your question? Yeah, no, but someone's vacuuming okay, my house. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll edit this out of the, uh, the video. Oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. Someone's vacuuming. I heard that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I want to, uh, thank you again, Mr. Irvin for the, uh, for letting me borrow your books, uh, and giving them a read. It was much appreciated. I enjoyed writing the books. I wrote six. I was happy to do one and then I ended up doing six. Well, I'm enjoying reading them. So thank you for, uh, lending them to me. This the one, that one you have there is the last one I did. Yeah, my 26 Stanley Cups. But I had retired by then. I wasn't doing that. Much. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I loved it. It was just filled with uh, with such, such such great stories and um, really pulled the, the, the reader in. Uh, I loved it. I'm back. Okay, Eric, uh, why don't you ask your question? <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, I can't hear you guys. Can't hear us? There you go. Good? Yeah, we're good? Okay. It's yours. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Someone's vacuuming my house. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, you've had many highlights over your career, but where does hosting the closing ceremony of the forum and being part of the legendary Maurice Richard, Richard standing ovation rank on your all time list? Well, you know, when you get old like I am and people, uh, your career is over, people say to you, What are your highlights? Uh, you yeah. know, your best moments in, uh, in, a, in a job like broadcasting uh, hockey games. I say there's two. For me, I, I pick out two. Um, and that's one of them, being the English host the night that they closed the forum, officially closed it, uh, March 11th, 1996. Um, but the other highlight, of, as I say, there's two that is working 17 years beside Danny Gallivan in the broadcast booth. Uh, young, you fellows don't know Danny. He was, well, there was Foster Hewitt, there was Danny Gallivan. They were the two idols of all of us. Uh, and when it came to hockey broadcasting, they were the pioneers, really. And uh, uh, so in, in Danny's case, young broadcasters from that era, they had a given uh, whatever to do 17 games with Danny Gallivan. And I ended up doing 17 years. So those are the two uh, main highlights in my mind uh, when uh, the Rockets Ovation was really something. I watched it the other day again. I found it somewhere in my uh, Google. I don't know how, <laughs> and, uh, as I'm not very uh, good at that stuff. But there it was. The whole ceremony was on and the, uh, the ovation for him. And uh, it was really something. I went through the same thing uh, pretty well at the All-Star Game in Detroit in 1980, I guess it was, yeah. when Gordie Howe came back. Gordie Howe had come out of retirement, played in the yeah. WHA. Then he, the WHA became the NHL and the Hart, he was playing for the Hartford Whalers. 
So he was selected to play in the All-Star game. And it was in Detroit, as it turned out. It was one of the mm -hmm. first things ever held at the Joe Louis Arena, which has now been replaced by another arena in Detroit. And uh, so when he came out, the ovation was almost as long as that of the Rocket, which just shows you what people thought of those two guys. Oh, yeah. Monumental Wait, players in this league. Yeah. Yeah, is, is that when he played with his sons in the WHA? Yes, yes, uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I forget if they were in Hartford with him or not, but uh, uh, Mark played in Hartford. I know that. I don't know about Marty, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that, that was it. Oh, yeah, well, two uh NHL icons. Um, the Montreal Canadiens and Quebec Nordiques have gone through years of rivalry uh, on the ice, but off the ice, they always try to outdo each other uh, when it came to ceremonies and other stuff. Uh, most notably, this uh, profited the media personnel uh, when it came to pregame meals uh, during the playoffs. <laughs> uh, I read this story in the book. I loved it, and I thought uh, people should absolutely hear it. Well, this was during one of the playoff years. I don't know exactly what year it was, and... Uh... You know, they, during the course of the seasons uh, leading up to this particular time, uh, you'd go to the press room, you'd get a meal, free, you know, we'd freeload, and uh, you could get a hot dog if you wanted between periods, and it was both were basically the same. Now we go to Quebec City for game one of a series between the two teams, and the Quebec, Marcelo Bou, who owned the team, ran the team, he had set up a meal, <laughs> and here, we walk into a dining room, with, with tablecloths and cutlery, strolling musicians playing Quebecois music, uh, waiters all dressed, waitresses all dressed up. I mean, it, and the Canadians, when the game was going on, the Canadians brass, the two or three people, whoever it was, they had a meet, they, were, they weren't watching the game. They were having a meeting saying, what can we do when they come to Montreal? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, big, the big story wasn't the hockey game, yeah. it was the fact that the he said, put on such a, a splash for yeah. the guys to eat their supper with. Yeah. <laughs> so we get back to Montreal, which was always just used to be like the hot dogs and the, you know, whatever. And sure enough, they had waiters and waitresses and the guy <laughs> playing the violin. And they, they, it was a joke, but it was, it was hilarious. And, and yeah. I don't imagine you get that anywhere today, you oh, know, no. anywhere. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, that's, that, that, that's a good point. That's, that's a good memory. Yeah. Yeah, what I found hilarious is that during the series, they would do this, but if the Habs would beat the Nordiques, the next series, they just would go back to burgers and hot oh, dogs. Oh, yeah. No, no, nothing. nothing <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Same old, same old. Yeah. 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 Okay. So over your career, you had the opportunity to interview many players. However, you're also able to interview many Hollywood celebrities. Who was your most memorable celebrity to interview, in your opinion? Uh, Bob Hope. Bob Hope. Um, Bob Hope, in 40 years of broadcasting, I guess I could say I did, uh, you know, starting with my local news and uh, so on. Um, I only had sweaty palms once where I was really nervous, and that was when I interviewed Bob Hope. I guess uh -huh. he's the most famous person that uh, I ever interviewed. Okay. And uh, I was in, uh, I took a, long after I retired, I took a trip with a uh, Canadian seniors tour we went to Palm Springs for two weeks, Palm Springs, California. And that's where he lived. And he had a mansion of a house way up on the hill, one of the mountains uh, surrounding that area. And I remember they, they pointed, we couldn't go, to, you couldn't get near it, but uh, it was pointed out to us, there's Bob Hope's house. And well, I was a big shot. I told people, oh, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, of But course. really, I, I did a terrible job. Uh, he was fine. He was all right. Uh, funny thing about that, though, it was taped. Before a, a hockey game, uh, he was in town to do a show based on the 1976 Olympics. And the Canadians in Chicago were starting a playoff series, and that's the game he was at. And he sat through the game and went into the Canadians' dressing room after the game. But we pre-taped this interview uh, an hour or so before the game started. And the word was, if the tape stops, if something happens, then you say, well, wait a minute, we got to, Mr. Hope will get up and walk out. It has <laughs> to be done once, once only, that's it. And thank goodness, the good old CBC, they came through, nothing went wrong, and uh, we got the interview. So. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, the picture of me, and that's when we had our powder blue jackets we were, we were yeah. wearing for yeah. Hockey Night in Canada. The picture of me and him, taken by a, a CBC photographer, I guess, during the interview, was in the Hockey Hall of Fame for about 10 years. Wow. In a photograph display there. I don't know why they picked that picture, but there I was. 
Oh, wow. That's, that's great. That's my good buddy, Bob. Yep. Yeah. Um, in your book, uh, you mention uh, a player quite a lot. And of course, his name is Morris Richard. Um, he is one of your favorite players. I know that. But my question is, in your book, you talk about this. You say that Morris was, uh, Richard was such a symbol and hero to the community and to Habs fans and Montrealers. And then in your book, you also mentioned how um, he touched the community in a way that uh, Gretzky and Lemire just couldn't get to uh, on a personal basis. And why was Morris Richard just this, this icon in Montreal? That's a very good question, Matthew. Uh, I, I really don't know. I, I, it could be a provincial thing in mm-hmm. Quebec, us against them. Uh, Rocket was French Canadian, of course. Uh, first time I ever saw him play was his 15th NHL game, and he broke his leg. Scored two goals early in the game. He was just a kid. Nobody ever heard of this guy. And uh, before the game was over, he had been injured, broken leg, and he didn't play again that season. Wow. But um, uh, and just before I get uh, – here's a story for you. The, the, he had played uh, my amateur hockey on his way up to the Canadians, uh, and he had broken his ankle. He had broken his wrist. Now he could plays for the Canadians. Uh, Fifteen games into his career, he breaks his leg. And the manager of the team, Tommy Gorman, he thought this guy's too brittle. He's not going to last. He gets he's, he ends every year in a cast. He's, he's never going to play. So he told my father at the next training camp that he had just made pretty well made a deal with the New York Rangers to send this young unknown player, Maurice Richard, to New York. I don't know who they're going to get in return for him. And my father was very partial to this young kid who really hadn't proven anything yet. And he argued. They had quite an argument. And my dad won. Thank goodness, <laughs> he would have been traded to the Rangers. And that year, he scored uh, 32 goals, and they won the Stanley Cup. And then the next year, he scored 50 goals in 50 games. Yeah. And the Rocket was born. You know, that's how he made it. That first but player to score 50 goals. The way, the way he played, um, people ask me who the best hockey player uh, I saw. I don't have a best hockey player. I've seen too many best ones. Mm-hmm. But I always, my answer to that question always is that Morris Richard is the most exciting hockey player I ever saw. Gila Fleur, the most exciting hockey player I ever broadcast. His rock had retired a long time before I started broadcasting hockey games. But you know, when he was on the ice, uh, I think about this often. When he was on the ice, you thought there was the chance he was going to score. Yeah. No other, didn't matter if he had played a game that night that, that, that really hadn't noticed him, and they all do that. Um, but whenever he came on, especially if the game was close, tie score, one goal down, whatever, you had the feeling he might score. I've never known another player that left you with that, that feeling. That's what he was like. He, he, and he would, you know, I mean, very often (laughs) that he, you know, he, he's, he had a record of 82 goals in the Stanley cup playoffs. Wow. He never played more than 12 playoff games in one year, and he only did that once. Today, the guys can play as many as 25 playoff games, you know? And that record stood until Michael Bossy broke it. Now, when was he playing? Like in the 80s and yeah. 90s. That's how, and mm-hmm. Rocket played, scored his last goal in a playoff game in Toronto in 1960. Wow. So that record stood for 25, 30 years. It yeah. shows you how far ahead he was of everybody else. And that, like the playoffs were when it really counted. And that's sure. when he really That's did. where you showed up. It was amazing. Exactly. It really was amazing how he had that knack of doing the, the right thing at the yeah. end. He was yeah. tough. He was the best one-punch knockout guy. Never, nobody gives him credit for this in the history of the Montreal, of the history of the National Hockey League, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I remember that story in your book, uh, the Valley Field story, where um, yeah. he was in the stands. And, well, you can tell it because uh, – I don't want to take your thunder, but um, I thought it, you know, when that in the Valley field, when the guy talked to him and said you were too good enough to, to play in the game and then whack right in the yeah. face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Rocket, yeah. The exhibition game. The year after they'd won the cup in 53, and Rocket was playing in the exhibition game on a Sunday afternoon in Valley field before the uh, start of the season. They didn't, don't, don't do that. There's no Valley field teams yeah. to play anymore. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> he wasn't feeling very good. And he was, he had a bit of the flu. And so after two periods, my father said to him, just to take the rest of the day off. You're not feeling good. So that was it. So he changed and got into his civilian clothes and he went up and the place was jammed. So he had a stand in the standing room at the back with, uh, with the spectators. 
And one guy got mouthy with him and he started, he came right up to him and he said, what's the matter? You're not playing the Valley field, not good enough for you. Yeah. Big shot rocket, you know, and rocket stood there according to eyewitnesses who I talked to after. And, uh, I was still working at show in those days. I was, <laughs> but, um, so the rocket had enough of this guy and like you did bang, <laughs> knocks the guy down the stairs down the butt, and there's a big fight the players all see this happening they leave the game they jump over the boards they all get in the big fight big hassle in the stands wow. so a few nights later my dad and i were at a baseball game the montreal royals ball team there's another new one for you young guys <laughs> and uh toe blake who had coached was coaching valley field was also at the game and uh so we ran into toe when we were leaving and my dad said, what's that guy that Rocket hit? Is he going to sue us? And he said, sue you. He said, he's walking around Valley Field going any place he can go, saying, with his black eye, saying, look what the Rocket gave me. <laughs> he was the happiest guy in town. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. my. So, so stay on the topic of Toe Blake. I have a question here. So in your opinion, which era of the Montreal Canes do you, you believe was the most dominant? Toe Blake's 1950s team or even Scotty Bowman's 70s team or even any other era? I'll take Scotty's era. Okay. Uh, the late Red Fisher, who was my best uh, media buddy in hockey. Uh, we used to argue about this. He was a Blake guy, uh, the 50s era. But I, you know, I mean, you can argue about this uh, until the cows come home. Uh, but I'll take Scotty's team, uh, you know, okay. the, the Lafleur, the Robinsons, the Savards. Yeah. Over the Richards and the Harveys and the, uh, uh, you know, Bellavos. It's 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 a toss up. It would be I tell you, it would be one heck of a hockey game. Oh yeah, yeah. Play, you know? <laughs> and, it would. Uh, I mean, you 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 take a look at, at those days. You had you had definitely dynasties. I mean, Montreal won five in a row at that one point. After Scotty Bowman, his team won four in a row. Then the New York Islanders won four in a row. Yeah. And then the Edmonton Oilers won four out of five. So in that period of, you know, not very many years, only three teams won the Stanley Cup plus one other, Calgary. And, you know, they, but you're not going to get that anymore. And you don't. I mean, everybody, no, no. you know, it can be Tampa. It can be ever since the Canadians won their last cup. I mean, who's won the cup? Tampa's won it. Carolina's won it. Anaheim's won it. That's, it it's all changed now. LA's mm -hmm. won it twice, you know. So uh, that's what's changed. You won't get those. People like this won't be arguing about something like this in 10 or 15 years from now about today's era of teams because they just don't exist anymore. Like yeah, that. exactly. Um, staying on the topic of the recent lack of success, we could say, of the Montreal Canadiens, we could say they have been mediocre for about two and a half decades since they last won their <laughs> cup in 93. Uh, um, yourself, have you ever reflected on the state of the organization uh, in today's uh, day on how do you feel about current younger Habs fans about missing out on all this glory and can you tell them what they were missing out well they're missing out for sure um, <laughs> it's too bad we were spoiled you know I when they won the Stanley Cup in 1993 that meant that the Montreal Canadiens had won the Stanley Cup at least once every seven years since 1940 Wow. A long time. That's 53 years. They yeah. managed to win it, you know, sometimes four and five times in a row. Um, and if you'd have said to me, I did the dressing room interviews again that night. Um, if you'd have said to me, you know, you're not, nobody is, is going to do this job again for at least 25 years. I just said, what are you talking about? This is the Montreal Canadiens. You know, they don't go 25 years though winning the Stanley Cup. Come on. They haven't <laughs> even been in the finals. In yeah. The last yeah. Yeah. That's the big difference. I noticed a change in the last few years that I traveled with the team. The Canadians, they lost their swagger, if you want to mm -hmm. use a word. They traded away to me, and this is strictly my opinion, they traded away the players that gave them a little bit of an edge. The guys that when they walk onto the airplane or onto the team bus or into the dressing room to start a game, they had a confidence about them that, like, they knew they were going to win. You know, Patrick Waugh, Guy Carmino, Kirk Muller. Uh, these guys were the best. Chris Chelios. They traded away their best players. I don't know why. They traded <laughs> away Pierre Turgeon. He was the captain of the team and, without question, in my mind, the best player on the team. 
they traded them. I mean, and, and therefore they became a, a bunch of nice people, nice guys to travel with. I never had traveled with that team for 33 years, never had a problem, English, French, whatever, never. But they lost that little extra mm -hmm. touch. I can remember them coming off of a bus, coming into an arena, say in Boston to play a big game with the Bruins in the playoffs. And you just knew from their attitude when they, that they were going to win. Yeah. They knew they were going to win. Yeah. The team lost that. And I, I, I don't travel. Hey, I haven't been with the team for many, many years now, so I can't comment on what they're like today. But to me, even while I was still there through until the late 90s, uh, that's what happened to the Montreal Canadiens. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I don't think it helps either way when your first round picks haven't really transitioned into those NHL types, obviously when it comes to their drafting, but hopefully this, uh, this young core team and the future of the Montreal Canadiens can uh, get them back to that uh, successful state they once were in. Yeah. Uh, no, no. There's, time uh, will tell. There's, there's yeah. always, Hey, hope for rest of the turn off. Come on. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and I think uh, a good friend of mine in Edmonton is a good <clears throat> hockey man. He used to, play hockey, coached uh, in pro hockey in the States. He uh, wrote me an email a couple of days ago, and he likes the Canadians. He likes their, uh, the possibilities of the future. He likes the mm -hmm. young players that they've got. And uh, so, uh, you know, he's a pretty astute uh, guy. He thinks that in uh, – he's looking at a pretty good team right now. He's yeah. uh, pretty exactly. good players. Oh, he thinks <laughs> – he thinks that he's from, as I say, from Edmonton. He thinks that – they read their press clippings too much. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. They're they're too streaky. They yeah, too, yeah uh, exactly. You know, but the time will tell there. For sure. Yes, time. Optimism, of course. Yeah. So yeah, so this off season, the Montreal Canes added key player uh, key pieces to the lineup to give themselves one of the deepest teams in the league. So there were high expectations for this year's team, and they certainly have not uh, met them yet. Uh, can you tell us if there's a team of the past that reminds you of today's team? one that underperformed and failed to meet their high expectations? No, I can't, uh, Eric, really just uh, name one off uh, the top yeah. of my head. I, you know, I, I lived through the Bowman era, mm -hmm. um, and uh, then I lived through an era in the 80s and the early 90s when they didn't even make the playoffs. I okay, mean, yeah. yeah. You know, it, 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 uh, the last year that I broadcast for Hockey Night in Canada was the 98-99 season. And that year, the Canadians, uh, what happened to them that year? I don't think they made the playoffs that year. You know? And there was another year, the year the Rangers uh, won the Cup in 94 that we spoke of before. Mm -hmm. They were eliminated in seven games of the first series by Boston, uh, the Canadians. And uh, thankfully, Hockey Night gave me lots of work uh, from then on. <laughs> I ended up doing all that, that series between Rangers and Vancouver that year. That's one of the best series I ever covered. But it was uh, really good. But... Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hockey. There's so many teams now. Hey, there's going to be another team next year. Exactly. Yeah. When I started broadcasting hockey in, uh, for Hockey Night in Canada, that number that's right behind your shoulder, Matthew, number yep. six, six. There were six teams in the NHL. Original when six. I left broadcasting in 1999, there were 26. Wow. And now, starting next season, there's going to be 32. Mm-hmm. So that's why you're not going to get the dynasties. That's why you're not going to get a core of, of five, six, seven players that will win a Stanley Cup for you like Edmonton had and like Montreal had and the Islanders had. It's not going to happen anymore. Yeah. And so that's why it's tough for me as a very, very much on the sidelines observer to figure out exactly, you know, who's going to do what. Uh, nobody knows. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Talk to the guys who cover the games. Nobody knows. If I had to answer that question, because I still hear it to this day from my father, was the year when the Edmonton Oilers, the young Edmonton Oilers that were 16th seed going into the playoffs, up actually upsetted the first seed Montreal Canadiens. Yeah. That's one he still can't get over to this day. Um, and so uh, I would say that probably um, if I had to answer that as well. But um, moving on to a next question, uh, Sam Pollock. Uh, can arguably be known as uh, the best G uh, general manager in NHL history, uh, winning nine Stanley Cups in 14 years, a record that will never be broken. And um, what was it about Sam's abilities uh, as a general manager that made this team so successful over the years? Well, you see, that that's where the Canadians down through all their years had, had the edge. They had mm -hmm. uh, very astute uh, managers, uh, Frank Selke, 
um, followed by Sam Pollock. Uh, he was just a very smart hockey man who learned from good people on his way up through the Canadians organization. He started scouting players on standing on snowbanks in Snowden, uh, <laughs> looking at for, for young, they'd hear about a young kid that was really good playing in, for Snowden or NDG or something. So they'd send Sam to, <laughs> to watch him to see if he was worth following up. You know, a kid might've been a midget or whatever. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just a case of, uh, you know, who, Yet Sam had uh, had his moments. Guy Lafleur had a very weak start to his NHL career. You know that he, in his third year, he scored 21 goals. Uh, he was on the Stanley Cup winning team of 1973 in his second year, and he was not a factor on the team at all. And he was less of a factor the following year when he only scored 21 goals. So that summer. Uh, Sam called in Scotty Bowman and his assistant coach, Claude Ruel, only one assistant in those days, not five like they have now. And uh, he called him in in the summertime. They had a meeting. And he said, I think I'm going to trade Lafleur while we maybe can get something for him. You know, he's still Guy Lafleur. He's yeah. still in one draft choice, etc. And Scotty and Ruel had, they had a big argument, just like my dad did with Tommy Gorman when he wanted to trade Morris Richard. And the coaches won the argument. And Lafleur stayed on the team. And the next year, wow. he scored 55 goals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. And I, there was a period there starting right with that season. Uh, and that was one season before they ended up winning four cups in a row. Where, to me, Guy Lafleur was the best hockey player in the world. Because Bobby Orr was, had to retire. Phil Esposito, who I had great admiration for, one of my all-time, all-timers. But he was getting older and he had been traded to the Rangers and it wasn't quite the same as when he was with the Bruins. Gretzky hadn't arrived yet. Um, I think that for that period of time, for those four, he, he, I think like he never got less than 50 goals. One year he got 60. I mean, give me a break. The, the Montreal Canadiens haven't had a uh, 100 point score since Matt Naslin in 1984. Yeah. 100 yeah. points used to be nothing. Steve yeah. Eiserman one year playing for Detroit, wonderful hockey player. Yeah. Had 153 points. Are you ready yeah. for that, you young guys? 153 <laughs> points. Yeah. You know where he finished? Fifth <laughs> in the scoring. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so, yeah. so, so yeah. that's what it was like then. That's you had Wayne and you had Mario and you had all these guys. Exactly. It was really something. Oh, know? yeah. I, I think we also got to credit Sam with the, the move in the book. He traded... Was it a 50 goal score to a bottom NHL team to assure he would get the first overall pick uh, the next yeah, year? Yeah, it wasn't and a 50 draft. goal score. It was oh. uh, Ralph Backstrom, who just passed away a few weeks ago. Oh, uh, sad news. And uh, Ralph wanted to get out of Montreal. And uh, Sam was convinced that the Oakland Seals were going to finish in last place. And he had made a deal with, he made a deal with Oakland that he was going to get their first draft choice the following draft. And that's when Lefleur came up so he to help oakland finish last he traded ralph to the los angeles kings who were there <laughs> like second last and baxter made a big enough difference he scored a few four goals for la at the end of the season 13 or 14 goals whatever and that guaranteed that oakland finished last and la finished ahead of them because they won <laughs> and therefore he had the first choice yeah that yeah. was the only time i ever knew sam pollock to do anything humorous because when it came the draft was held here in Montreal at the Queen Elizabeth Hotel and when it came time for the draft okay number one draft Clarence Campbell was the president of the NHL number one draft Montreal Canadiens uh, your choice and Sam Pollock said time Mr. Campbell you know they teams <laughs> teams want time to discuss things yeah. everybody in the world knew he was going to pick the Lafleur. yeah and, and then the whole room laughed you know that's funny so the same <laughs> day the day after sorry the day after John Beliveau retired Guy Lafleur was drafted by the Canadians. Oh, so wow. The old saying used to be the tradition continued. Oh, wow. Of yeah. course. And it did. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, no, another question here. So, Montreal is known for having great rivalries with teams such as the Toronto uh, Maple Leafs and the Boston Bruins. And I, I'm a Detroit fan. So, I was just going to ask. So, uh, one ri rivalry that many people tend to not know about is the 1950s uh, Detroit Red Wings versus Montreal Canadiens rivalry. Can you explain to the audience? why this was such an intense and important rivalry back in the day. Well, you hit it right on the nose. If, if you, yeah. uh, I, well, that's just when I came to Montreal, we moved here in 51 and uh, uh, 
Detroit had Gordie Howe, who wore number nine. Yeah. Montreal had Morris Richard, who wore, who number, wore nine. number nine. <laughs> That's all the fans needed. You know, you'd go to the game in the pregame warm up and you'd walk, oh, there, make sure that each number nine was going to play good. He's there, there tonight, <laughs> you know? That's fine. And uh, oh, it was bitter. Red, the late Red Story was a referee for many years in the NHL. And those teams used to play each other 14 times. Like now, with this, well, this is unusual this year. But they used to play each other 14 times. And Red told me, he said it didn't matter whether those they were playing in October at the first game of the season or in the seventh game of the Stanley Cup final. He said you could cut the tension with a knife yeah. on the ice when those two teams played. Yeah. And, you know, people ask me about the best player that I ever saw and, and so on. In those days, in the early 50s, I mean, there was all the talk about Rocket and Howe and Ted Lindsay and Doug Harvey. I used to think maybe the best hockey player in the league was goal, was Terry Sajak, who was the goaltender yeah. for the Detroit Red Wings. I mean, goalies never get considered when yeah. they come to best players. Why not? They got a job to do. It's not their fault they're not scoring 50 goals. <laughs> and Sajak won yeah. the cup uh, a couple of times for Detroit. Without him, they don't win. I'm telling you, he was something else exactly. again. And uh, he beat the Canadians in 54 when the, when the <laughs> – the seventh game of the Stanley Cup final went into overtime and Doug Harvey shot the fuck into his own net. Wow. Oh, I the Canadians lost that game. But, uh, you know, in those days, like you take those two teams and those two, but the last two years, my father coached in Montreal. They played Detroit in the finals and both series went seven games, which meant that those two teams, the best, they were way ahead of anybody else. In yeah. hockey. They played each other 21 times. Wow. And that yeah. was, you know, and that was, yeah. I can remember that many years later, the Toronto Maple Leafs played the Canadians once, you know, yeah. when, when the schedule was all, it was all different. And uh, yeah. So, oh, it was, uh, it, it was wonderful. You know, and yeah. uh, the fans knew the guys by, all uh, by on site, nobody wore a helmet. So you saw all the, the heads, you knew what Marty hey. Pavlich looked yeah. like. You knew what Tony Leswick looked like. You knew what Red Kelly looked like. Uh, it was a wonderful time. Uh, to watch hockey especially the Faxons, yeah. morris richard ted Lindsay, oh. uh gordy how they all finish like one two three in the uh the overall uh, point standings yeah and so that right. just added more fuel to the to the rivalry exactly. um yeah. but uh let's shift to uh today's nhl where due to covid19 the nhl has adopted these divisions uh, where teams would face each other around eight times, uh, more nine to ten in the North Division with all Canadian teams. Um, I know when you in your book you reference how in the 50s and the 60s, uh, teams used to play each other around 14 times uh, a year, and uh, which is certainly how you create a rivalry. Um, but uh, my question is to you, uh, the North Division with all Canadian teams that are facing each other around nine to ten times, is that something uh, you'd be interested in seeing moving forward uh, for, for the game of hockey, or would you prefer to go back to those original uh, divisions? That's a good question, Matthew. I, I would prefer, like, you take now here in Montreal. I'm not uh, a fan that I used to be, but does anybody know anything about the natural Predators? Are the San Jose Sharks? We never see them. You know, yeah, what I mean, yeah. it, it's that that they're gone. They'll they'll show up in the playoffs. Yeah, we'll, we'll see them in the playoffs. But I, I I think to see all these different teams come in, that wasn't a bad thing for me as a fan to be able to sit at home and watch, as I say, Nashville one night and Anaheim the next night. That's pretty good. That was good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe they can get too much of a look. You know, I mean. These teams now play each other. What was it? There were two teams that played each other four times in a row. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, okay. That happens in the playoffs. Yeah. When you have the, the best you know, the series go six games, seven games. But that's different. The playoffs are different. The Stanley yeah. Cup's at the end of the road. There's more tension. There's more pressure. There's more interest. That's, but the, for this regular season, like somebody wrote in the Toronto Globe Mail a couple of weeks ago that people thought, there was a thought that with this business of the seven, uh, with the, the, the Canadian division, mm -hmm. that they would create wonderful rivalries yeah. during the course of the season. This guy, and he was right. I agree with him. He said, it's created wonderful boredom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. You're seeing, <laughs> because you're seeing the same yeah. teams over. Oh, over. exactly. So there's, you can look at it both ways. I mean, I, I, I hark back, hey, I, I'm, I'm kind of going against myself here. 
I kind of, I hark back to the great days when the Leafs and the Red Wings used to play seven times. Uh, they were oh, yeah. 14 times a year and another seven in the playoffs. So uh, now I'm saying that's too much. Uh, <laughs> it, it depends. Uh, but I'll, yeah. For sure. Um, for our last question uh, here, um, yourself and Danny Galvin were known as being the best to do what you guys did. Um, from the first game you broadcasted alongside uh, Mr. Galvin to the last game you broadcasted, what did you learn uh, from working with Mr. Galvin, and how did that help you become the broadcaster you did? Well, thanks for the compliment. Um, <laughs> the one thing that, uh, that Danny... I think as I look back, the one thing that he taught me was to be prepared. Uh, go into a game with, you know, he used to have what we, Danny would bring his shirt board from the laundry and he would write his notes for each team on the, on the board. And we used to laugh about Danny's shirt board, but that's what you have to do. I know that the, the and there were a few over 33 years where I maybe didn't do as good a job as I could have done. And I can look back to every one of those games if I felt, and nobody, my employers, I mentioned that in the book, no, nobody, in, I, I used to wonder, is anybody watching? They, they never used to say anything from game to game to game. We'd go, to, go yeah. home and drive home. But uh, if I felt that I did a subpar job and cheated the listeners and the viewers a little bit, it's the nights I wasn't prepared. And... Uh, so, you know, and that, that went for radio as well. I did radio for 29 years. The, game, if the games weren't on TV. I did them on radio. And uh, first the FCF for uh, 22 years, and then more than that, 24 years, and then the last five for CJD. And uh, the same thing happened. It was the same thing. You had to do your homework. And that's what Danny taught me most of all. And, uh, you know, and uh, so he was, uh, he was a, a very good mentor to me in that way. And, you know, we used to, uh, I used to have, I, for seven years, I was the host of the show. I used to call it my upstairs, downstairs, uh, part of my career. There are no elevators at the forum. And no yeah. day, couldn't do it today. <laughs> and uh, so I, we, we wouldn't, I wouldn't arrive in the broadcast booth till the first period was, say, two or three minutes old. And then I'd have to leave with three minutes to go to go back downstairs to do uh -huh. the, you know. And Danny and I had really no social contact over all those years to any great degree. Uh, but, uh, we, we got along all right once the red light went on so that's what that oh that's great well um i think that'll do it for our yeah. interview uh we asked the questions uh we wanted to ask and we just want to thank you again uh dick uh for accepting to be on the um the interview i know i speak for eric we are very lum yeah. uh, humbled and lucky uh to be interviewing uh someone like you so i uh, just as always thank you for keep saying yes and uh, <laughs> well, those, Eric and Matthew, thank you, and good luck with it all. Perfect. For those uh, again uh, looking to hear more about these stories uh, and the history of the NHL, I recommend my twenty six Stanley Cups, and of course, there are other books in the uh, collection of Mister Irving's. So go check it out if you're interested in that. And if you are listening on Spotify or watching on YouTube, we thank you for listening. Uh, we were just here with author, Hockey Hall of Famer, and Foster Hewitt recipient, and the voice of the Montreal Canadiens uh, over decades for the Hockey Night in Canada, Mr. Dick Irvin Jr. Thank you once again, and thank you for listening. We'll see you guys next week in the next episode. Peace. See ya. Peace.